Good afternoon. I'm Ray Allegreza, editor at large of Home News Now, and I have been with IFRA for a number of years. And I want to welcome you to the latest episode of The Last Word. For those of you who may not have tuned in, shame on you, but we'll let that slide. The premise of this podcast is we seek out thought leaders and talk to them about their views of the industry. And because everyone knows I talk a lot, my guests actually get the last word. So with that in place, I would like to welcome a true thought leader and a, and a close personal friend, Amy Archer. Amy, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Ray. Well, thanks for being had. You look great. And I know you're <laughs> down in Florida and everything is sunny. So let's get right to it. You know, I you've been in the industry a long time and so many people know you. Just on the outside chance, if they're newcomers to the industry watching the podcast, tell us a little bit or tell them who you are and what you've done. You know, I, I kind of always ask that question to me too. Like, why did I make a living, uh, you know, looking and designing where people sit? You know, I think that's such a weird gig. And I think it happened for me It is is when, I don't know if you remember that show, I Dream a Genie. Do you remember that, Ray, that show? Yeah. Well, I was a, when I was a kid, I would be with my parents and we would go over to someone's house and I would literally think that I could, uh, by doing this, you know, like Jeannie, that I could change their home. And not all genies can do tile work and paint work, but I could. And I realized just at a young age, I was just fascinated with how people nested, what, you know, how a space could nurture and look and what subtle changes uh could make it work. So I became kind of more interested in the psychology of how people live. That was really fascinating to me. You know, I'd, I'd be at the airport and I'd see what people wore. Was it casual? Was it dressy? You know, were there patterns, no patterns? And then how could I translate that into how people lived? So I've had the privilege of working for many companies. Um, you know, each one kind of faced with how could I take what their skill set is? So like an American leather, high end, um, also getting into the textile business for them, but how could I ride that higher peak of taste level for them? A Lee industry, which had a designer following, Row, which was my beginning, which was an incredible learning curve. How could you, uh, how could you deliver at a price point something so so seductive that that people would follow? Um, even my last gig, which was Klausner, which was a short gig because of their demise. But I was really intrigued with how can you how can you bring um, again a value study to to a story? So each company gives you a different a different challenge, which is this is what we know how to do. Um, this is our toolbox. And how should we play? And I think that's a really exciting, uh, an exciting gig to have. So I didn't stray too far from, you know, being eight years old and being a genie. Just, I get it. Yeah. And you, know, you didn't mention <laughs> it. And I do want to mention one of the industry's highest awards, and mm -hmm. we can't argue this, is a Pinnacle Award. Mm -hmm. And when you are at American Leather, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. You won or Mm -hmm. earned a pinnacle for fabric to frame and that that doesn't happen often so we're talking with somebody with really good credentials you know when when you when you gave us the setup just now you made me realize an interesting thing you you prompted me to ask you a question that I really hadn't planned on asking mm -hmm. ours is really a a bipolar industry in a way because on one hand everything is lowest price lowest price and then we turn and the other face is aesthetics and beauty and design so how did you manage to balance those two things so successfully all these years? And long term, is one going to be stronger than the other or we do, do we need both? First, I love that question. Um, the, I don't, I think if you look at as a training study, for me, I always look at Target. Target did something so brilliant and that's that they didn't underestimate the taste level of the consumer at any price point. And as I befriended people with far more worth than me, they were still shopping at Target because they they found something there, you know? So I think number one is no matter what price point you're given, don't underestimate the taste level. I've been in apartments that are tricked out and gorgeous, 
And I've been in multi-million dollar homes that are empty and more of a facade. So I think to understand that people want to be recognized and seen in their homes and respected in their homes at every price point. And I, I think that's an important, wherever I go, uh, I really try to hold that as the top mantra. Now, when you're, when you're in a company that has uh, is known as a luxury brand, like Lee was in American Leather, you you got to train faster. So meaning you got to look at what Europe's doing and hit that curve faster. You've got to bring out product that's a little before the market seen it saturated. But we're at a time where there's so much technology and speed and information that those curves have changed. So I, I, when I'm working on a price point, I try to bring the curve down a little bit, meaning has it been out? Is there recognition on that? Where do people feel comfortable? So in general, the, the there's really, there's really a number one mantra. Don't underestimate the taste level and also make it worth the money. Don't follow a, a trend. So that's so specific. So like I had a designer come up to me once and say, look, I'd like you to make my product, but I need you to explain it to the consumer because it's so out there. And I thought, you know, actually I won't. The market will tell us what it can absorb. If they, if I need to explain it, then, then you haven't met the market need, right? So I think you can't, you can't get into some, you can't follow a trend so fast if you don't feel it's, it has authenticity to it. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And that's great advice. And, you know, with your background in upholstery, is it a push or pull? How much of what we bring to market is based on what we think consumers want? Or do they not have a clue? Do they not have an ice cube's chance in hell until they see it? Is it is it like that Supreme Court judge when they asked him about pornography? He says, you know, I, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Is that is that how the consumer reacts, for example, when they go into shop for upholstery, do you think? Hey, I can't believe I'm following a pornography lead. I can't believe that's my lead in. So hey. Thanks for that. Um, I would say it's all about seduction. Do you know what I mean? I, I guess I am talking about pornography. So what, you know, I love fabrics and cover to frame. And uh, I think a lot of times people shop the exact same product. And unless the vignette speaks to them, unless the fabrics talk to them, unless the marketing story around it, the the fabric's ability to do something different is it stain resistant uh you know uh, microbial resistant is it and today is it eco-friendly all those things are coming up for seduction right so does it look good and does it tell any story um if you if you look at i think to move the, any any showroom into uh, uh, an order right into people wanting to write it up you can't underestimate the power of the cover you know, the frames are going to get subtle, but we're in a time of tremendous texture. You know, you've heard about the Sherpers, the wide whale corduroys, the, you know, I say it's a hand and ass business that you have everyone's touching it, it's tactile, right. and then you have to prove the ass test. You know, it has to be, has to sit right, but it, it really is studying the subtleties of the game. You know, and, you know, one hand you can follow the trends and then if you're lucky, you can, if you do it well enough, you can make your own trend. And I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I just mean, say a palette's out there that exists, but you want to spin it slightly. That, that to me is a merchant's gig, you know, is how can I take something that if everyone out there, every buyer that's, you know, uh, you know, sat in the middle seat, finally got into high point, you know, bustled through checking in, gone showroom after showroom after showroom. Where can you do to bring them in and just say, you know, we, this is, this is, this is going to be, this is going to speak to you on many levels on, on a value story, on hopefully a speed story. You know, I always say there's like three, there's three, if you can get three parts of the stool on the ground at the same time, the one being, is it a value? And I don't mean unaffordable or unaffordable, right? I just mean, is the value there? So it can be expensive, but still be valued. Is Are you earning your price point? Is it special enough to earn that price point? Or is it inexpensive, but still has value? You have to have a value story, right? And the other component is um, the speed. Right. And can I can when can I get it? Are you playing a speed story? So how quickly can it go? Or are you going to pay for a bench made custom piece? Like where is your ability to deliver? Right. You know, and the third is the quality. And most of the time you're going to get two parts of the stool easily. And the question is, can you get the third? 
you know, inexpensive. Sometimes you you question your quality, but you might have a quicker turn, you know. So it, I always try to see how I can close, how close I can come to getting the three stools on the, the three legs of the stool down, if that makes sense, because I that's the success story. OK, now we re react to this one um, for years as a reporter, as somebody that went out and wrote stories about upholstery and talked to retailers and talked to manufacturers. The knock I would hear about the retailers from the suppliers is they all challenge me. They want a lipstick red leather sofa. They want a cobalt blue sofa. And then I bring it in as an as a sample and they go, I'll take brown. So are are we getting away from drowning in that sea of brown, do you think? And why? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we're always going to be in natural conflict. I mean, I believe in conflict. So I believe that sales should ask for everything and that uh, merchants should try to satisfy that, but also not just answer the needs, but lead the needs. Um, you know, I've probably been asked in my career to do a resort handle. 10 times and never once has it sold, but I was always a cry, right? I've always been asked, you know, uh, what can you do to make it jack it up? And then it sells more modest. So I, I believe in that conflict. The question is, is there a way to do it that is a little more subtle, you know? So, um, you know, the reality is no matter what we try to do, what how much we hear, how much we listen, how much we drive, how much we read, how much we pursue, the market will tell us what they're ready for. So my gut is test the market. If, if, if like personally, if I have struggles using red, which I do sometimes, how can I bring that in in a way that I would consider it? You know, so I just try to sedate some of the riskier moves and see if I'm right. And do I miss opportunities? Probably. But my number one thing is how can I keep a factory working full time? How can you have salesmen that uh, are thrilled with the zeros, you know, on their commission check? And you, you can't be in a game where you're only interested in your own uh, reflection of your of your talent, right? So, you know, sometimes when you've done it for decades, you kind of want to design for your own your own personality, right? Like, what can I do to inspire myself? It has to be where you're tethered to the company's success. So, how can you how can you reflect what's going on, but also how can you really really respect that you you're the subtleties of when you are you know a merchant that's driving a line is that your number one thing is their employment. Good. You know, you mentioned the salesman being happy and obviously putting my IFRA hat back on again firmly. Yeah. Um, tell me the good, bad and the ugly uh, about reps that that you have worked with. What what do the outstanding ones do consistently? What do the mediocre ones do? And what should the ones that are not up to snuff be doing? No, to me, it's a really important dance. You know, I I feel like any merchant that doesn't listen to their sales team is is remiss. I feel like any merchant, though, that only listens to the sales team, meaning they only make what the sales team has told them, which a lot of times is a me too business. Such and such has this, I want to do it for less, knock it off. Right. That is a very common thing. And many times as a consultant, if I go into a line, I can tell that they've that the sales team has run the merchandising team because I call it, uh, can you do me a favor? I can see their line as, can you do me a favor and just make this? Can you do me a favor and just change the arm one inch? And what happens is the line becomes overscaled for the volume, right? So there's too many SKUs for the business and it, it doesn't have an identity anymore because you were trying to just watch everybody else and come after it. So I totally understand a salesman's desire to say, just give me something that I already know someone else is selling. That that's, that's natural. That makes total sense. But to me, and this really depends on the marriage of the merchant to the sales team. If I say to them, look, I I'm hearing you, but I want a chance to lead. I want a chance to tell you where I think we aren't going to be eating our competing with what's already been done that that a great salesman will test me right will say so let's see what she's got and then open up to say hey that's fresh i want a shot at that and they now come and knock on doors and they don't have a me too business then right and that's a whole different gig for them 
I think salesmen that are afraid that just feel like, um, look, it's all about price or it's all about this or it's all about that. They're always going to be in an adversarial relationship with creative because the times have changed where we can't always just keep knocking the price down and keep, um, you know, marketing, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, the the degree of class, the imports, the this, you 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 can't have it all. You can't just uh, ransack the price and elevate the experience. So I think that's an important dance. So to me, great salesmen push me, but they also wait for me to lead. And if I disappoint them, I fully expect them to come back at me and say, here's where I think you missed the mark. And I love that. What I don't love is don't give me a chance. Do you know what I mean? To me, that's hard because if you if you only want to be led by what your sales team tells you to make, you actually don't need a merchant. You know, you don't need a hitter. You need someone that's just going to put cover on it and do do the best they can. But you will now be competing with every other door that already has it. So I would just say it depends on the dance. Okay, good. And you know, you are a rare bird in the aviary of uh, furniture world because you design product, you do fabric to frame, you understand textiles, but you do, you're a colorist, you do colorist, you do sales training, you do motivational speaking with marketing. all that in mind. Like marketing. Yeah. And, and marketing. All right. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's always perturbed me is, <laughs> you know, the dairy industry's got milk. The, the chicken people have the incredible edible egg. Mm. We have nothing other than no down payment, no interest, no nothing, no nothing. I mean, should we have an industry-wide slogan, considering the depth and breadth of our products? You know, a, a while back, the AHFA did a blue ribbon panel, and they try to come up with a uh, a blue ribbon slogan for the industry, and we never got one. I mean, my personal choice was furniture. It's an F word, but nobody liked that. But what <laughs> would you suggest? Is there is there a slogan or can we get away with a, a unified message that would um, entice the consumer to take a look at our products? Yeah, I don't know how to answer that from a macro level. You know, I, I only know how to answer that from a micro level. Like I just came from a consulting gig um, last week. And one of the most important things to me was how to message it. You know, how do we, well, how do we talk about, about messaging? Yeah. I think that, you know, one of the biggest lost opportunities is, and really retailers taught me this. I had a call with Jordans and they, he, I was talking to him about some things I was working on. And he said, Aim, bring me a package, bring me a collection, bring me talking points, bring me something that isn't a sofa that I have to drop in a corner because that's a good looking sofa. You know, Mr. Jerry Birnbach, who was the CEO of, of Roe said to me, I don't care how good you are, no sofa will change our industry. It will not change. So, so you need to bring me something bigger. What is it? What's the next thing? What's what's the collection story? What what makes it unique? What what's my talking point? And I think that's essential today. That's why I can't just separate myself as a merchant because I couldn't give up that. I you have to own the story, right? Like right. otherwise you're, you're shopping ones, right? You can't ones when you walk into, uh, when you walk into, uh, you know, uh, wherever you want to shop, a Macy's, a JC Penny, a TJ Maxx, Saks Fifth Avenue, whatever, right? Well, not Saks. I'll say the smaller, the lower end ones, they put all the clothes out and they say, good luck, find them what you like, right? And then the higher end you go, they start to say, are you a this person and Eileen Fisher? Are you this J. Crew? Are you this? Are you this? And there's been kind of a struggle on a macro micro movement. Should we put everything in there and hope the customer finds it? You know, I know a lot of times if I talk to a retailer and they'll say, I already have that. Do you though? Because no one can find it. So the question is, you know, I, I think it is a really important time today. People are... Um, you know, there was years where we didn't have enough furniture in a way, you know what I mean? You had to design fast and now we have more furniture than needs. You can get it everywhere. The question is, how can you earn that partnership? You know, how can you do something that feels special? And many times it's your story. You know, what kind of company are you? You know, what kind of relationships do you have? What kind of, what thought have you brought into your offering, right? Is it just a sofa or is it more? 
you know, and I think that's, people are going to be, they're going to be shopping more of a emotional, financial, sensory level today, you know, and smaller retailers are, I think a lot of times have a more boutique agility to speak to the consumer. And if they don't, then I think it's the merchant's role of saying, what story can I tell that we can start to put in a big box, right? Which is why a lot of big boxes are doing, you know, smaller galleries, in my opinion, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that the, the the messaging and the story is as important Huge. as the product, because if you if you don't connect with me and, you know, they say retail is theater. Nobody wants to walk into an empty theater or, mm -hmm. or see yesterday's movie. So I think we need to do a better job talking about doing a better job. You know, we've seen the the statistics still say that the majority of home furnishing purchases are still made in store with brick and mortar. Yeah. But cheer um online is is growing in, in terms of popularity and, and they're selling large items. Do you think that the online retailers, by virtue of they may be a little more savvy with screens and their photography? Do, do they do a better job than some traditional brick and mortar in in wooing the consumer, telling the story, creating the message? Yeah, it's furniture foreplay. You know what I mean? When you look at what they're, uh, you know, they're, they have to take seductive shots. They have to watch their wordsmithness, right? What are they talking? How are they talking? How are they condensing it? You know, I spent yesterday just reading all the descriptions, you know, that I could find that Creighton Bow wrote, or, you know, I just think they're great wordsmiths. And, you know, how do you, how do you start to just, uh, you know, uh, learn on all those levels? I think people are shopping online, being very digitally focused, but the sale closes still in the store, you know, because they, they, no matter what, a lot of people still just want to sit down. Can you blame them? I would, you know, before you I, fork out of a couple grand. So definitely, but it's playing a much more important role. You know, the 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 setup, the the internet is is guiding the consumer towards the simplicity when the retailer isn't. Sometimes I think the internet's really and the different sites have helped them focus. Good. You know, speaking of the the technology side. I, I'm starting to see more and more integration of artificial intelligence in the business. Um, what impact do you see that having now and where do you see it going? I mean, I, I just did a story for Home News Now about IKEA took a lot of their service people off the service thing and had all had artificial intelligence um, answer all those questions. And then they took these telephone customer service guys and train them as quasi designers and mm -hmm. their, you know, average ticket went through the roof when people called in, mm -hmm. but what else, what, where do you see AI um, helping our industry? A lot. I mean, I, uh, last, last year was the first time I did a AI design, not me personally, cause I don't have that technical advancement, but I worked with a guy that I would tell him what I liked, give him a sketch. He would do some kind of AI magic work. And it, it ended up where in six months time where he could show me what looked like I made the sofa. And then I could use that for uh, marketing tools, digital work before I had created it, right? So you're, you know, we, we're, we have six months to create a line. And so the fact that we could use AI to make it look complete before it was ever made was just mind boggling to me. And, and honestly, month one, two, and three, we weren't able to do it. It went that quickly. The last three months, it started getting better and better. Then there was a, a woman in uh, the West Coast that had been doing AI background work, right? So she would drop it in and you would just send her these images and the rooms that she would create were so sensational. They didn't look comical or, you know, or like it was a, like a apple sitting on a table. It looked disproportionate, right? These were rooms where your, your piece looked like it had been there forever. So I think there's going to be tremendous advancements towards what's going to happen. You know, I, today, if I was creating a team, I would have an AI specialist on my team. I'd want to work with someone for mainly for the speed of the, the fact that the renderings can be, look so completely, you know, look like made furniture, completely gorgeous furniture. And that 
I could use that from marketing before I, I, I can run the, I can get where by the time I go to market, I'm, I'm showing a room scene before it was ever completed. And then I just have to build backwards up to it. So I think there's a tremendous advantage today towards what it is. I know people are doing GPT chat and all that, and I've played with it. Personally, I think it's overly verbal. You know, sometimes it just kind of, I, I don't know if I'm using it right, but I, I, I am very sensitive to how we phrase things in our industry. I try to not use words that have been used over and over and over again because they become, you know, static. People don't hear it anymore. So I, I just think, you know, sometimes you can pick up a couple of cool phrases from them. Um, but I think that's still a learning curve. To me, if I use GPT chat, you know, which I looked at for descriptions of product, I'll ask them to speak in the voice of an author I like, you know, something where it can be a little bit more witty or a little bit less predictable. Yeah. So. Good. All right. so almost out of time. Next to last question. You know, earlier we talked about a an abundance of product and inflation, and and you know there are some supply chain issues and container prices go up and down. Now they're back up again. Looking at that from your perspective, as someone's been in the industry for quite some time, and and as twenty twenty, what do you think the remainder of the year is going to look like for us, hmm. and why? Is that my last word? Because I'm not too good at that question. Oh, you're going to get a last word after this. Is I, the might, I might dive on that one. Um, You know, I've never been good at fortune telling. You know, I always feel like my my best gift is to is to do the best I can. I know that sounds so minimal, but I just don't think we can we can we you know, we've been surprised many times. You know, someone coughed, cough, flu, pandemic. You know, I mean, there's just been things that have wiped the slate. There's I don't I we can't prepare for all the tomorrows. All I can say is again, the three the three legs of the stool, stay focused, you know. Um, you know, it takes a lot of courage to 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 decide to represent a line, whether you're the president of the company, whether you're the CFO and or, or whether you're the, you know, VP of merchandising or whatever, it takes a lot of courage to say, we're going to go forward with this and put enough support into all the pieces of that, the messaging, the, you know, putting enough fabric and leather on the shelves. It's, it's a big commitment. So whatever you do, do it well enough where you are, where your commitment gives you a solid chance to the market. I think our biggest thing is because it is so risky sometimes is that we don't get fully in and then we 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 question did we fail and really there were so many pieces of that that we didn't own, right? So mm -hmm. my thing is don't carry every ball. But what you do carry mean it. You know, because then then your ability to go above the fray of chaos, right? Whatever happens in the industry, whatever it is, if you've really created it, you can stand on some significance, you know, and weather a little bit. I can't say you'll survive at all, obviously, but I think you have a better shot. Perfect. Now I'm going to give you the last word, but before I give you that last word, I'm like that bad, you know, HNN show, you know, but wait, there's more. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and yeah. How are you filling your days? And then then give me a last word of wisdom. I literally just fed tuna fish to a pond, you know, for the fish. So I I, I think I may be underachieving right now, but hey. uh just a tad, right? Um, you know, I'm at a funny place in my life where I I'm consulting and uh I love that because I like to use all the components, right? I'm interested in all the components. So for companies that are intrigued being, um, you know, kind of sharing their tool chest and seeing if they're going the right direction or just saying, hey, I wanted, I want you to help me create something, but I also want the marketing piece and all that. I, I'm, I'm excited that I can carry some of that. If somebody wanted to talk to you further, can you give, are you okay giving us your email? Yeah, can I give it to you though? Or do I have to put it on a 1-800 line? It's wrong. It's just wrong. I don't you know. Just, you could just I'm not that popular. Tell me yeah, right okay. here. Yeah, right now, give it to you. No, right Ray. Now. It could go. It could go anywhere. I could be picked up by a troll. I'll tell you later. All right. Okay. All right. But no, I love the consulting. But I'm also, you know, and I know this is a really. I think this comes with age, and I've spoken to a few uh, <laughs> players in our industry that have, um, 
you know, similarly, you know, I color my hair, but let's be honest, that sucker is probably white by now. I'd say that a lot of people right now are just, I want to work for people where you're not pushing against them. You're, you're carrying with it. Right. And I think that's one of the most important things to me today is um, it's scary when someone comes in for a few minutes or a few days and professes to be, you know, whatever to preface, to be the, the industry expert on, I don't care what it is. There's always a lot of pushback and I'm really, I really, you know, truly authentically only want companies to do well that I play with. And I'm looking for an environment where that really feels mutual, you know? So if people hold back or they feel adversarial or protective, it's hard to move into, into legitimize the, the dance. Right. So yeah. I'm, I, I'm consulting and I, I'm very fortunate that my phone's ringing um, but not so much that I can't feed the fish. And that's probably what I want. You know, I want a balance where, uh, where I do show up that, um, that it's just companies that are intrigued enough to see if they can be better and to analyze it, you know, towards where really are, what is my offering based on my, on my gifts, right? Every company has a gift. Uh, and are we, are you, are those in sync? right? Because you, not every company can be anything. And when they try to be, it's usually a colossal failure because, you know, I went into one company that had such a monstrous amount of product. And I said, you know, it's kind of like if you're hungry and you want to go get something to eat, the, the, the restaurant that has everything you kind of don't think of because you want a really good version of something, right? So, so I think really today it's, what do you stand for? And do you need help finding that? That's where I like to play. That does it for me, kiddo. This was great. <laughs> I understand you know, if you push delete now. No, I just don't want you to get a phone <laughs> hand. My phone rings all the time, too, but it, it calls about my car's extended warranty. Oh, you know, I got that one, too, the other day. It does yeah. make me feel special. Okay. All right. So, well, uh, later, special. brother. Go feed the fish. This was a great, great chance to catch up. And I learned a lot, as always. And I really thank you for taking time to be with us. Pleasure. All right. Keep it real. See you, Ray. Bye.